would like to thank our seminar supporter, Mitsubishi Tanabe Pharma America, for supporting this seminar. We would not be able to provide these educational programs without the support of our generous partners. For our next session, we will be shifting gears to talk about the importance of mobility and play for children and how assistive technology can be used to support their development. Um, I love the title of this presentation, The Fast and the Curious. Um, I'd like to welcome our guest presenters for this session, Dr. Heather Feldner and Dr. Sean Rundell from the University of Washington. Dr. Heather Feldner is an assistant professor in the Department of Rehabilitation Medicine for faculty in the Disability Studies Program and an associate director of the Center for Research and Education on Accessible Technology and Experiences at the University of Washington. She also co Co coordinates the UW Go Baby Go Mobility and Socialization Program and is a faculty advisor for the Husky Adapt Toy Adaptation Program. Her research centers at the intersection of mobility, disability, and technology, including how perceptions of disability and identity emerge and evolve through technology use. Her current work incorporates multidisciplinary mixed methods approaches drawing from her background as a pediatric physical therapist, doctoral work in disability studies, and postdoctoral research in user-centered rehabilitation and design in mechanical engineering. Sean is also joining us today to co-present. Uh, Sean Rundell is an instructor in the Division of Physical Therapy at the University of Washington. Sean is an APTA board certified clinical specialist in pediatric physical therapy and has experience working as a physical therapist in preschools, in birth to age three and preschool programs for children with disabilities and delays, in an outpatient pediatric and home outdoor based clinic and with adults and children with cancer. She is the co-director of the UW Go Baby Go program and is passionate about creating early mobility opportunities and technologies an inclusive, accessible outdoor environment for children and adults with disabilities. Dr. Rondell and Dr. Feldner, thank you both for being here. I will now hand the reins over to you. Wonderful, thank you so much, Marissa. We really appreciate that intro and we're very, very excited to be here with you all today and to get to talk about the fun that we get to have in our, uh, in our jobs every day. Um, and I think, Sean, you're going to share the slides here. Yes. That showing up all right? That looks great, thank you. All right, um, so in um, just before we get started, um, we have a, um, a tradition that we keep in, in Washington where both Sean and I are, uh, and that is to um, include a land acknowledgement in um, our presentations and I uh, would like to invite all of you to reflect wherever you may be joining from um, to reflect on the lands in, in which we all reside and acknowledge these as ancestral homelands and traditional territories of indigenous people. And the University of Washington specifically, um, uh, we acknowledge the Coast Salish people of the ceded and unceded land, um, which touches the shared waters of all tribes and bands within the Duwamish, Puyallup, Suquamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations. And we just have a few disclosures in terms of some of our funding. We won't spend too much time on that. Um, and just to uh, give um, a little bit more background, um, Marissa gave a great introduction. So um, I will just um, mention that um, I'm a Midwesterner by original background um, in the US. Uh, and I um, transitioned from um, my work at Marquette University um, in uh, also at the University of Illinois in Chicago, um, and then came west to the University of Washington. Um, I use she, her pronouns, and um, I identify as um, a uh, cisgender and white woman. I have short gray and brown hair. I wear dark rimmed glasses, and today I'm wearing a gray sweater and a white shirt. 
Um, I do not identify as disabled or with a disability, and um, that both limits and shapes the perspective that I can bring to um, these topics, um, although I do study them academically. Um, and I do have family members um, uh, with disabilities and a caregiver um, of both children and parents um, who are disabled. So um, with that, I will turn it over to Sean. Thanks, Heather. Hi, my name is Sean Rundle. Um, it's really nice to meet you all. Um, I used she, her pronouns, and today I'm wearing a gray dress. I have short, uh, dark curly hair, and in the back I'm working from home. Uh, I have a colorful, multicolored quilt in my background today. Um, my background in this topic is I received uh, my degree in psychology from the University of Colorado and then my doctor of physical therapy at the University of Washington, um, where I am currently an instructor. And I have a clinical background, as Marissa said, in pediatrics, um, as well as some adults, so kind of across the lifespan. Um, and my scholarly work focuses on creating opportunities for early mobility um, through co-directing University of Washington's Go Baby Go program as well as uh, diver diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging initiatives at the University of Washington and within Washington State um, as well. Um, I also do not identify as having a disability, but I am a family member of several individuals with um, physical and mental health and visual disabilities, um, including mobility issues, and that really shapes um, my perspective uh, as well. We aren't going to read the course objectives in detail, but in general, we're really excited to give you some background on um, mobility for everyone, on time and self directed mobility, and then get into some toy adaptation, uh, the Go Baby Go program, and other resources and solutions. And we really hope to hear from you um, because we have learned so much from the families and children that we've worked with about creative. Uh, and low tech solutions for um, meeting mobility and play and beyond. <clears throat> so this is just our quick outline and I'm gonna turn it over to Heather to, to start off on the background. Thanks, Sean. And so we just wanted to start out with um, a, a question to you all that you can uh, ponder um, uh, to yourselves here. Um, and that is what does community mobility mean to you? Um, and we might all come at that question um, as, as from different perspectives. Um, for some of us, it might mean we can play with our friends in the neighborhood. Um, for some of us, it might mean we can get to our medical appointments from our apartment buildings. Um, for some of us, it might mean we can go to restaurants and theaters. And for some of us, it might mean we can go skydiving. Um, and so just thinking to yourself about what community mobility means to you um, to hopefully set up the um, uh, discussion that we're going to have over the next hour or so. And one of the places um, that we like to start, especially when we're thinking about childhood mobility, is um, um, based on those kind of personal understandings of what mobility might be, it can sometimes be hard to kind of land on what we actually mean when we're talking about this. And so um, let's take a look at one of our basic and most collective understanding of mobility, and that is the dictionary definition. And so we've included both locomotion and mobility here. So locomotion, um, according to Merriam-Webster, is the act or power of moving from place to place. Mobility is the ability or capacity to move, the ability to change one's social or socioeconomic position in a community, and especially to improve it. And so what are some of the things that stand out to you in this definition? And Sean, if you could do one more advance, that would be great. For us, what we see in these definitions is that mobility is power and mobility is also social. Mobility is what allows us to interact and participate in our worlds and also to change our social position and, and status. And that's really significant if we think about mobility across the lifespan. Next slide, please. And so just some statistics to share with you in um, our home state of Washington. Um, we know that um, um, uh, both Washington and broadly, more broadly, I should say, 
Um, we know that about 95 million children under the age of 15, under the age of 14, excuse me, have a disability. And we don't have great statistics on how many of those children could benefit from mobility technology, but we know that likely half um, could benefit. And, and, and hopefully, you know, we're going to be um, getting some stronger statistics in that to help um, really push our fields forward um, and um, the availability and access to mobility equipment for kids who need it. Um, and we know in Washington State um, that, um, and, and this is a fairly old statistic now, so we know it's higher than this as well, um, but about 5,500 children in Washington alone re receive um, early intervention services from birth to three. And that's a, such a critical time in development where we can be intervening with mobility technology while we're continuing to work on other skills like motor skill development. Next slide, please. And so I um, would venture to say that if you are um, a part of this community and, and, and are, are joining us today for, for this talk, um, that you, um, like us, um, might consider community mobility as a human right. Um, and that's, you know, that's a powerful statement, but that can sometimes be easy to forget or, or not, you know, um, not easily interpreted based on, you know, our own contexts and environments. Um, and so I would also um, venture to say that regardless of whether we identify as a parent, um, as an individual with a neuromuscular condition, as a caregiver, as a professional um, in this sphere, that we are human rights advocates in the work that we, we do, um, whether that's self-advocacy, whether that's advocating for technology. And facilitating mobility then when we're talking about um, mobility technology and play. Um, it's not just a healthcare technology or an intervention. It's certainly not a fix for something lacking at an individual level, but rather it's an opportunity to design, build, and implement the right tools and technologies build and cultivate the right environments, and also advocate for the right policies to support and empower a diverse community where people move and think and communicate in different ways. And one of the ways that um, we can advocate is we can point to rights-based documents that really guarantee the right to mobility as well as the right to technology that supports that mobility. And the two I just want to mention briefly are the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, um, which was published in 1990. The image here on the left is just an art, um, a, a, a pictorial view of all of the different articles within that document. Uh, the document on the right is the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities um, that was um, created in 2006. And these two documents, again, have specific language that talk about mobility, that talk about the right to technology to support mobility and participation. And one thing that we can't forget about is um, the right to play. And so all of those um, document, all of those kind of tenets are built into these, these rights-based documents. And so this is a wonderful source um, in terms of advocacy and helping to um, create an Im impact policy to support um, technology and play. And there's um, a list here of several different articles that are specific to those two documents um, that relate directly to mobility, um, technology, and play, in addition to things like health and rehabilitation, access to education, and self-reliance. And so that's kind of the framework that um, that Sean and I think about when we think about the, the work that we're doing that, that we're going to share with you uh, today. And so one of the other things that I wanted to just touch on is um, a little bit of background about um, uh, what we now kind of call on-time mobility. 
Um, and if you are a parent or if you are a professional, um, you may have heard in the past the term early mobility. And what that typically refers to is when a child is um, able to access some form of mobility technology um, within probably the under five years of age range. Um, and so many of you may be familiar with this term early mobility. And the um, what we know from the history of kind of how this came about is that there were pioneers in special education, there are pioneers in rehabilitation and in engineering um, that really um, helped advance access for children to these types of technologies. Um, wheelchairs in, in the past weren't necessarily created for children. Um, and so there were some really um, amazing pioneers that um, not only um, made those introductions, adapted that technology to fit bodies and needs of, of younger children, but also started writing about that as um, a right to access and to participation. And so we have seen these really neat pockets of progress, um, movements like Go Baby Go that we're gonna be talking about today, um, toy adaptation. Um, there's individuals and programs across the, the globe that have really been innovative and creative in um, tackling mobility challenges. And there are products around the world that, that are increasingly being um, produced to support um, this this right to mobility at younger and younger ages. Um, and there's a, a news, uh, a, an article uh, clipping on the screen there. And this was an article that was written in 1984. And this was written by the mother of a 20 month old child who um, advocated for and then wound up with her family um, building a, a powered wheelchair for their daughter at 20 months of age. Um, before this was really routinely considered um, uh, for, for most children. And in this article, um, a couple things I wanna point out. Um, there is a reference here to that 20 months is late for a child to begin walking. Um, but by no means outside the quote unquote normal age for mobility. We feel this was important in many ways. Um, that we wanted our child to walk at, or our child to have mobility at the same age and stage that was available to other children her age that were walking. Um, and they, um, she goes on to say, children who have to wait until five for the chance of independent movement have already established behavior patterns in themselves and in others, which are difficult to unlearn. So in 1984, this, this mother as an amazing advocate um, was really calling for more and more access to technology to support the mobility of children with disabilities. And this is, you know, we've, we've seen the needle move a little bit, but we haven't really, we're still working towards these things, I think, um, in, as, broader, as a broader community. And so again, how did we get to this term early mobility to refer to the, the three and four and five-year-olds that, that might be accessing technology? Um, and you know, again, it was really those pioneers that um, were investing time and effort into adapting um, technology that was not originally designed for kids to um, be used by kids because they saw that as a real, a, a really significant need. Um, and really in the kind of medical equipment world, there hasn't really been a formal definition of what early mobility intervention is, um, but operationally it's been used um, to refer to that period, um, kind of that preschool age period from age two to age five, um, where children may have access to mobility tech. Um, and this is specifically um, and most often done for kids who are either delayed in their gross motor skills or who may not walk efficiently as their primary means of mobility. And it's been adopted by researchers, by, by um, professionals, the, the, the industry, by families, um, et cetera. But I think the question that we need to ask ourselves um, is that we know that moving is more um, than just going from point A to point B, right? We know it's powerful and we know it's social. 
And um, we really have an opportunity to embed a higher frequency and an earlier start to these self-initiated mobility technologies. Um, and what we kind of have recognized over the last several years is this term early is really a misnomer if we're waiting until a child is two, three, four, and five to provide opportunities for self-initiated mobility. When we know that kids without disabilities are experimenting with this and learning about mobility in their environments and being social within that first year of life. And so one of the things that we've been able to do um, just in the last uh, year or two is to um, create a framework called on-time mobility. Um, and this is, again, just to support the, the, the different opportunities and the, the frequency of mobility opportunities for kids um, starting within that first year of life. And whether that be through, you know, um, motor skill training, whether that be through technology. Um, and there are kind of five key principles that I'll just briefly touch on here. Um, and those are timing, urgency, multimodal, frequency, and sociability. So when we come to timing, um, what this really emphasizes is that mobility and thus the right to mobility emerges within that first year of life. And so interventions that begin later, especially the ones that we have called early in the past, are in fact late relative to the trajectory of um, uh, children who are, are, are typically developing. And so there um, becomes a gap that grows exponentially if we're not intervening at a time and providing equitable mobility experiences. Um, and so we, this kind of on-time mobility um, concept really proposes a shift in timing of mobility interventions that aligns with that trajectory to make that more equitable for kids who may not move in, in the same ways. Um, the next principle is urgency, um, and this really draws from a theory called embodied development, and this um, really like acknowledges the role of mobility and movement in creating widespread change across numerous developmental do domains. So in essence, we learn to move, but we also move to learn, um, and that happens in these rich contexts, in rich environments, um, in family and community life. And that, again, tends to unfold within that first year to two years of life. And so it really elevates the urgency for mobility throughout each day. Um, and, and again, whether that mobility is occurring through gross motor skills like crawling and walking, or whether that is um, happening through the, um, the use of mobility technology, it's that self-initiated mobility experience that leads to that cascade in development. And so we want to aggressively counter that gap that keeps growing um, if we're not intervening one way or the other. Um, the third principle is multimodal. Um, and I, you know, the easiest way to illustrate this is to, to think about all of the different ways that, um, that you or I might move around in the world. Um, we um, may use our body. We may use um, uh uh, wheeled devices, we may drive, we may fly, we may have bicycles, um, we may skate, um, we may ski, um, all sorts of different options. And this idea that children with disabilities are often constrained to a single type of mobility. And so we really um, want to broaden the opportunities to experience mobility in a lot of different ways. Um, in order to, again, um, really see all of those amazing social opportunities, as well as the developmental changes that happen. Um, frequency, uh, that is the fourth um, principle. And um, what we know from developmental psychology is that um, children who are moving throughout the world do so at a significantly high frequency. Um, toddlers can um, accumulate 14,000 steps and experience 100 falls and cover distances um, equivalent to 46 football fields in the span of just six hours during a, during, um, 
uh, uh, exploration in their natural environments. And this really underscores the necessity that this self-directed and variable movement really has to ha achieve a frequency um, that is high enough to create that learning process um, and to, um, again, um, ensure equitable access to participation and exploration um, with peers and family. Um, and so on-time mobility um, really um, uh, emphasizes a high frequency, again, regardless of whether that mo mobility is happening as um, uh, um, under someone's own body power or through the use of technology. And finally, the last uh, tenet of on-time mobility is sociability. And as we have talked about already, and um, as we all know intuitively from our own mobility experiences, mobility is inherently social. And having this kind of mobility rights perspective um, really mandates that our mobility interventions, including technology use, um, shouldn't be limited to controlled settings, isolated clinical environments, that sort of thing. Um, we really need to get out into communities and get out into the world and um, really reframe these mobility-related experiences as um, integral part of social experiences in, woven into the fabric of our communities and our lives um, and kind of emphasizing that these um, it, that these opportunities for mobility are critical for triggering those developmental cascades. Um, we, you know, think about how we can Im improve the sociability aspect of our interventions um, and advocate for policies that focus on social mobility as um, one of the um, important developmental outcomes of early childhood. Um, and so hopefully that just gives you a little bit of background of um, some of the kind of theory and um, development behind what we're going to be talking about for the rest of the session today. And we love this video. Um, just we think it sums up really the, the end goal here is that regardless of how you move, um, that you you have the right to move and you have the right to play and you have the right to socialize and um, as a child, especially, to be a troublemaker. Just want to be kids. At WizKids, we provide wheelchairs which help them do just that. But 70,000 children are still waiting. Please donate at wizkids.org.uk. Uh, I just love a lot of those images in in that video. Um, and and just so you know, we we have no affiliation with Wiz Kids. We mm -hmm. just love love the um, the concept. Um, uh, as Heather alluded to, we're going to talk uh, now about the benefits of on time and self directed uh, mobility. And the framework that I like to use um, in discussing this is called the International Classification of Functioning Disability and Health model. Um, it's often in the healthcare world known as ICF. And what this does is um, it just allows us to understand holistically um, the how a child or an adult can be impacted by their health condition and how they're all interchangeable. So uh, on the top in the light blue, it says health condition. An example would be a neuromuscular disease. Um, in the left on, in the middle is dark blue, it's body structure and function. And these are the physiologic functions and anatomical parts of an individual. So thinking about strength or range of motion or cognition, sensory and mental functions. Um, for example, or fitness. 
activities in the red box in the middle, which really refers to functions and tasks or actions completed by, by an individual, which is where mobility would um, include, uh, and that's mobility of any form. Um, uh, but it also includes really fun play skills, like throwing and catching and kicking a ball or pedaling a bike or propelling a wheelchair, getting on and off the floor. Ultimately, um, and to the far right is uh, in light green is participation, which is facilitated as friendships. And this really is um, the goal of what all of us as individuals, as parents, children, uh, caregivers, clinicians is really, you know, friendships, family activities, involvement in school, after school activities, and just community and life and vocational situations. And then at the bottom, we have on the left environmental uh, and on the right in orange uh, personal factors, otherwise known as family and fun. Um, but these uh, in include physical, social and attitudinal environments uh, in which people live and conduct their lives, as well as just one's own internal drive, interests and strengths. And, and what I'm going to do is um, talk about how early and self-directed uh, mobility and locomotion fit into each of these categories. So we start kind of at the physiologic um, function. Uh, early mobility really, um, and and travel, right? When we think about travel, travel just broadens the mind. Um, and travel, locomotion, mobility, um, all result in improvement in the response to optic flow. And what this just means is how we take in more information visually and how we understand kind of our, our body in space, as well as the movement of space and objects around us. Kind of those perceptual changes. We also can, um, through through traveling in all of its forms, um, have new onsets of memory and spatial capacities. We might learn how to play hide and seek or understand how different heights could make us wary and, um, and kind of understanding that things exist even when we don't see them anymore. And, and we also develop new forms of social referencing. So um, we might have uh, different types of communication with a caregiver uh, who's across the room, right? Um, and that we can explore and um, those spaces and still communicate socially with someone else. When we look at the research around locomotion and, um, and cognition and socialization, we also tend to see higher levels and increasing ranges of infant emotions. Um, and you can see on, on the right, there's an image of 16 different children expressing 16 different emotions. And we know that 16, there are more than 16 different emotions, um, but higher levels of mobility um, can result in more smiles, more vocalizations, uh, development of fear uh, in unstable perceptual situations. Like if we move up to a ledge and having an understanding that if I go over that ledge, um, I might naturally start to get a little fearful. And then also frustration. Um, and uh, this is some, this can be derived from new and sometimes challenging interactions uh, with an environment with a physical inter environment. After the onset of locomotion, um, we tend to see increased caregiver social engagement across all areas of development. So um, naming and describing objects, more smiling when their child explores, more demonstrations of affection and interactive play, different expectations um, of of kind of compliance um, or, or new expectations from their infants. Um, we see caregivers maybe uh, voicing no more often um, or parents uh, ex expressing their first um, feelings of anger. Um, and then we also see new and more intense demonstrations of affection like hugging and interactive play.
I think what's really uh, striking is that when you look at um, children who experience self-directed locomotion, regardless of how it's experienced, so whether it's through crawling or using a walker or a power mobility device, that um, there's really no differences in um, in in kind of the changes that that occur um, uh, across the, um, all of those areas. On the flip side, when uh, mobility experiences are lacking um, and, and children are not, not afforded these opportunities for mobility, um, we, we, the research is showing that um, children might have decreased self-initiation um, of social engagement, reduced cognitive development, um, poor spatial processing or responsiveness to that optic flow and perception of movement and kinesthetic awareness. Um, as well as decreased caregiver recognition and, and reaction at the child's attempts to communicate or move. Um, and all of these issues can then subsequently feed into a phenomenon of, of learned helplessness. Um, so I think that by providing on-time mobility experiences, we can actually improve all of these areas, cognition, socialization, communication, spatial processing, optic flow, that sort of. Um, and, and more. How this then impacts uh, our activity and participation is that locomotion in any form is really an essential activity that, that drives a child's ability to socialize, to prepare for employment, to engage in their schooling and education, enjoy recreation and leisure, participate in community life, and ultimately have increased freedom and independence. When we look at on-time powered mobility specifically, uh, research involving children with disabilities using powered mobility demonstrate incre significant increases in self-initiated peer interaction, communication, and other mobility skills, including walking, um, which I think is really uh, an important consideration, although I don't think walking is the end-all be-all form of mobility. Um, we should be celebrating all, all forms. Um, but, and the other piece of this that I think is important to note and that carries over to some of our work with Go Baby Go is that children with disabilities as young as seven months old can successfully learn to navigate their environment in an adapted power mobility device. So again, going back to that, that, that term of early, um, quote unquote, and what does that mean and, and is what we've considered early actually too late? Environmentally and contextual factors that might impact um, mobility, and I know that you uh, as individuals with neuromuscular disease caregivers, parents, families, family members, and clinicians probably have even more things to add to this list. Um, but I think some things that come to mind as we think about how, how mobility interacts um, with the environment and contextual factors are the environment ex itself, the accessibility of the space, transportation within the space, the mobility devices, um, how heavy they are, how bulky they are, how, how much they are in disrepair, the cost, the time to attain them, as well as the social stigmas and attitudinal barriers um, to, towards individuals who use different mobility devices. Uh, this is really, I think, um, important. I'm just going to briefly cover it uh, to note, but clinicians and students are being taught, um, I think, traditionally, we have really been, um, we are experts in child-focused exercises and therapeutic activities, teaching families and individuals how to use different assistive technologies and devices and strategies and some environment modifications. Um, but our education is continuing to expand on, um, although it hasn't, we haven't had as much in the past, um, these barriers to locomotion, lack of universal design, acknowledgement of disabling social attitudes, as well as advocacy measures that counteract these issues. And hopefully if you aren't already involved um, in a local university or, or physical or occupational therapy program, I think it's really important to hear voices of those with lived experiences to um, help educate therapists um, on these topics as well. 
This is a brand new open source research publication um, created with support by Permobile, um, in, um, which is a wheelchair manufacturer. And this guide was developed by Heather and her team, which included an occupational therapist and speech language pathologist. And it really delves into the benefits of mobility, the various learning stages for young children, learning to use technology, and it offers tips, tricks, and facilitating strategies based on current evidence and expert perspectives from clinicians and families with lived experience. experience. Uh, it is freely available at this link shown on the screen and um, also is will be provided in a handout. Heather, I'll turn it over to you to talk about toy adaptation. Thank you, yeah. So what we quickly wanted to do is just give you um, some, uh, examples of some of the programs that both Sean and I are involved in in relation to providing um, accessible technologies to kids of all ages. Um, and uh, just wanted to touch on Husky ADAPT. This is um, an acronym. Um, ADAPT is an acronym. It stands for Accessible Design and Play Technology. This is a University of Washington student organization that was established in 2017. Um, and um, both Sean and I have the pleasure of being faculty advisors to this organization. And its mission is to um, really foster an inclusive, sustainable, and multidisciplinary community supporting accessible design and play technology. And so the goals, the major goals behind the organization are to um, engage in toy adaptation, design challenges, and outreach. Um, so with toy adaptation, oh, if you could go back to the, the previous slide, um, Sean, thanks. Um, with toy adaptation, um, what we're doing is we're uh, hosting workshops where we're modifying off-the-shelf toys uh, to make them switch accessible. Um, this not only teaches technical skills and facilitates broader conversation about accessible design, um, but the toys, um, you um, people from the community can request toys and um, toys are all donated um, to local families, to schools, to clinics um, at no cost. Um, and the, the group of, of uh, toy adaptation leaders have been really great. They've also been involved in teaching um, K-12 education, uh, STEM education, um, and uh, really have um, just made a big impact in our in our local community. And there's toy adaptation communities throughout the United States. And so hopefully, um, this serves as, as a resource for, for um, those of you in, in different areas as well. Um, just in taking a look at the next slide, um, we've um, really, you know, donated um, several, um, you know, we're, we're nearing a thousand um, uh, toys donated across uh, the years, um, obviously with a little dip there um, with uh, the pandemic. Um, but what we're what we're also seeing is that this is a very interdisciplinary initiative. We've got students from engineering, education, arts and sciences, medicine, et cetera, and that's just been really wonderful to see. Um, and the uh, um, the toys um, again, um, most of them have actually gone to school programs, um, and then uh, individual families, and then um, clinic therapy clinics and other um, other venues. And so it's really a broad distribution of where the adaptive toys go. Um, as I mentioned, one of the other kind of main aspects of Husky Adapt is design. Um, and this pairs teams of students, again, from across all those disciplines and with community partners that serve as need experts. And so they bring an accessibility or a design challenge to their team and their team spends a, a quarter or two quarters um, ideating and creating prototypes, um, uh, low and high tech technology um, to for the, the um, uh, need expert and community member to solve an accessibility issue. Um, and again, you know, um, we've just seen some really great uh, return in terms of the numbers of um, uh, designs uh, as well as the design teams. Um, and we're seeing this uh, distribution again across disciplines as well as across um, uh, year in school for the students. So it's a really nice um, uh, opportunity to, um, to network and to learn new skills and to interact with others. 
Uh, the final aspect of uh, toy adaptation that I wanted to just touch on is community engagement. Um, and again, this is really where the um, teams go and conduct outreach with K-12 students, um, industry partners um, about accessibility and disability advocacy. Um, there is a YouTube channel um, where there are a lot of um, tutorials and meetings. We've had lecture series um, as well as a number of outreach events um, at some of our community partners um, around the Seattle area. So places like Microsoft, Google, um, and, um, and others. Um, and this has really just, um, the impact of this has just been great in terms of um, professional conference presentations across multiple different cities, um, publications, as well as um, the YouTube channel that I mentioned. And there are a few links um, in the slides that, that if you're interested, you'll be able to access as well. Um, and it's a growing community. And so it's just been really amazing what the students have been able to do um, with this. And um, we're really excited to see where it goes in the future. So um, many of you might be thinking, well, we've been talking about Go Baby Go and what is Go Baby Go? Um, I uh, will give you just a quick rundown. Um, Go Baby Go is another alluded to as a movement across the world, really. Um, it's a global movement um, that was started by Cole Galloway at the University of Delaware. Um, and it, what what we all do is modify ride-on cars that are kind of purchased off the shelf to serve as alternative early childhood mobility solutions. So um, we take we host workshops, whether that's with with community members, with families, with um, clinicians, with educators, with engineers, um, with anyone really um, is welcome. And we take these cars and we modify so that the foot placement to make them go is changed to a switch. We then can put the switch in a place that is meaningful and helpful for that child. And then we also can work to change up and do low cost um, off the shelf cars for um, the seat and change the seating and positioning um, portions as well. And we're working on some steering options, which we'll show you some pictures here in a minute. Um, we provide all of these, at least in, at our, um, at the University of Washington, we provide all these cars to families at no cost. And I think um, most of the, um, the Go Baby Go chapters around um, are doing the same. So it's through the partnerships and sponsorships that we host these workshops. And what they do is they provide children with customized mobility solutions to promote independence. Um, again, teaching te technical skills and facilitating that interdisciplinary collaboration and supporting research on the impact of early powered mobility. Um, I'll just play one of these videos he um, here for you um, that uh, shows some kids here in um, one of our Go Baby Go cars. Let's go. Nice job, Mia. What do you think? <laughs> You can see they're they're pretty fun. That gets kids low to the ground, and then I love the video too because you can see the playing friends. Really well. Um. Um. Uh, there, you certainly, there are, as I mentioned, there are several different Go Baby Go chapters around. Um, they all look different. Um, some are associated with universities, some are associated with clinics, um, some are associated with nonprofits, and some are just folks uh, designing on their own. Um, there are some Facebook Go Baby Go communities and some resources. Go Baby Go Connect is a national resource where um, you can find some different ways to, um, on your own, uh, modify cars as well. And then um, the University of Washington, we um, originally started as Go Baby Go Seattle uh, back in 2015, and we've recently um, migrated into the university where both Heather and, and I teach. So we are now UW Go Baby Go, um, and you can certainly uh, take a look at our website if you're interested in learning more about our program. 
which like Husky Adapt kind of has three different arms um, and we partner with Husky Adapt. So we really focus on kind of the development and collaborations in our community, um, the support through a parent advisory council and leadership team and fundraising and outreach um, and community engagement. We have adopted over 100 ride on cars and hosted 10 in person workshops, um, several community builds and continuing education courses and, enga and engaged hundreds of community members. And that list is only growing as we continue to engage our students across the university as well. Some ideas um, for some low tech car modifications. Heather and I are just going to kind of bounce off each other um, as well. But just to get the wheels turning and a lot of some of these ideas have come straight from the voices of children and families. And so I think it's um, important that this is not an all inclusive list and this list is continuing to be developed. Um, with input from individuals with lived experiences. So we might change up where we put steering or how how um, steering happens um, based on a child's ability to move their arms or maybe they're having a parent parent directed steering options as well. So um, this is an example of some parent controlled controlled steering. Um, Heather, I'll, I'll go back to the child steering mm -hmm. here in a second. Um, Heather, do you want to ch chat about this really neat child steering? Yeah, so this is actually um, a project that one of our grad students helped us out with where we wound up surveying um, parents and clinicians about steering options and came up with several different design ideas that were all 3D printed. Um, and so these um, were, you know, really um, uh, cheap, um, but durable materials um, that we could print, you know, in a matter of minutes um, using our 3D printer um, in the lab. And so we were able to um, come up with these design ideas with families who had previous ride on car experience and were in the process of um, testing some of those out right now. Um, but it's just a great, another great way to think about um, in addition to using some of the basic kind of materials that you've seen in some of the other pictures like tennis balls, PVC pipe, um, you know, uh, taped up wood, you know, we're really, really trying to use easily accessible, easily affordable materials here. Um, here's just another um, picture of some other parent con controlled steering options. Um, you know, we think about different switch placement options for for children, um, whether they uh, use their head to control the switch um, or bringing a switch up closer to them because of congenital limb differences. We use um, different low cost tools like uh, kickboards and pool noodles and like Heather said, PVC pipes to create different postural supports and seating solutions, um, some harnesses that we um, grab uh, as well. So there are lots of different ways that you can attach harnesses. This is a five point harness. Some kids just need a seat belt. Um, so we can kind of adapt to the child's needs. Uh, this is a picture here of a chest strap as well, and then a steering bar and then the front bumper. Um, to give a little bit a little bit more space and we are constantly. Um, getting new cars to adapt um, because cars just um, go off the market at at a high rate um, and so we've had it, our experience adapting several different types of cars i think um ultimately what we um uh are also looking at is developmentally inspired assistive technology. There are some cars that can um, be activated instead of you activate pushing the button, um, you can activate them releasing from the button. So if a child is working on standing up, they can stand up to move the car, sit down to stop the car, um, and different uh, powered walker mobilities. And then ultimately getting back to that play environment. Um, and there are lots of different ways to create low tech inclusive playgrounds. These are just some examples of ramps, um, kind of a car wash um, machine as well. Bringing um, innovation kind of to, uh, to families. And I, I wanna say as well, learning from families um, 
you know, we've learned so much. This is a picture here of a family who, after a Go Baby Go workshop, they decided they wanted to bring their child on a stand up paddle board. And so they developed a way for their child to sit on it. And I think that, you know, as therapists and families, we really uh, collaborate. You are the experts um, as individuals, as families, and we learn from you and are just so excited to continue the collaboration. Hear any of your ideas uh, in the chat of low tech solutions you have or things that we could be thinking of differently. We want to just recognize um, all of our mentors and collaborators uh, across many years and across the um, the globe that have helped us uh, with Go Baby Go and just everyone with um, on time mobility uh, as well. Um, and and just wanted to end today by uh, with uh, one of our favorite Go Baby Go adaptations. A family had said, it, um, "The car says enjoy today and eat my dust." Um, so with that, uh, we would love to open this up for questions. We have put our contact information at the top here. It's Go Baby Go at uw.edu, and we would love to hear from you in the um, few minutes that we have left. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Heather and Sean, thank you so much. I guess that last slide especially brought such a smile to my face that eat my dust. Um, I just love the the creativity and the, um, the all the things that you guys are doing and, and talking about the importance of play and the importance of mobility in ways that I hadn't thought about. Um, I have a young son. Um, he's three, and I, I just think about all the things he's learned by being able to to be mobile. So, um, great presentation, very informative. Um, let's see, I'm just checking the chat here. Again, reminder: if anybody has any questions or even any comments about, you know, um, different hacks that they've used with their kids, um, please share those in the chat. Give everybody a, a minute or two. Just to uh, kick us off, I will um, ask one of my own questions um, for a family that's maybe, you know, new to this and new to having a child with a, a physical disability and mobility limitations. Where would you suggest that they they start? Um, I mean, you know, a lot of our families do go to our care centers where they would see a physical therapist that would hopefully be talking about mobility or possibly wheelchairs. Um, but where would you have them start mm -hmm. in terms of thinking about play and mobility around their house? Yeah, that's such a great question. Um, I, I think one of the first places that I often refer families is to um, like social media groups um, online, you know, um, more, you know, you've got kind of the, the, the formal like or, you know, organizational um, uh, websites and groups and such, but I think families, um, uh, communities of support that are a little bit more informal, um, where kind of everyone's going through the same thing and and um, can learn from each other and can support each other. I think that's a really awesome place to get really creative ideas when it comes to play. Um, and um, also, I think being you know open to discussing with. Um, clinical teams to, um, you know, hey, I read about this really cool thing where they're adapting toys. Like, do you have any in your clinic or do you know where I could get some? Um, I think so much, there's so much power and, and empowerment that happens in some of those more informal spaces. I think that's one of the first places that I think of, Sean. I don't know if you have anything to add. Um, no, I, I would agree. I think that, um, uh, connecting families with other families, um, but also um, just being, you know, like so many times I've heard families bring to me different different solutions and hey, like I just heard about Go Baby Go and or whatever it is, or, you know, to toy adaptation, would this be appropriate for my kid and how can we get connected? And I think clinical teams and therapists, even if um, they don't, maybe they don't have one in their clinic, but they've been looking to get 
to get cars or get toys and um, and you can help facilitate that process um, or or connect with them or connect with us um, as well. But families helping families, I think, is mm -hmm. really um, great. Mm -hmm. Are there any resources out there for like kind of DIY um, hacks that people can do if they don't have a go baby go or don't have something local um, where they can get that kind of help? Is there any reliable resources that parents could go to? Yeah, um, Go Baby Go Connect is definitely one of those resources. Um, there are kind of vetted um, how to instructions for different car models and such. Um, one of the other really great resources, um, you know, there are like for Go Baby Go, there are a lot of chapters around the country. Um, but what also um, we've we've seen and we've participated in is we've partnered with um, school groups and robotics clubs um, in high schools. Um, the, the high schoolers, I mean, they're eager to learn new skills. They're eager to make an impact in the community. And so we've even advised um, robotics teams and school teams from afar, and we'll just have virtual conferences and they're um, gathering the materials. They're the ones that are kind of doing the builds. Um, and, and they're always eager to, to get connected with, with families in the community too. So I think that's another great resource um, out there. Um, there are also, like I'm thinking of websites like Enable, uh, which is the letter E and then N-A-B-L-E. Um, Makers Making Change is another one where it's more crowdsourced um, but, uh, you know, again, um, kind of vetted 3D printers, um, uh, uh, 3D printing communities um, where you can do a lot of customization and, and, and talk with folks about really specific um, needs related to um, access um, or mobility. Great. And don't see any other questions coming in, um, but one more for you are there from like the academic uh perspective are there clinical trials things like that that are going on in this space at all um that families could get involved in do you know of anything sean do you want us to take that one or do you want me to <laughs> uh i'm gonna let you take it Heather, since you are uh leading some re some amazing research at least <laughs> Yeah, that is, that's a great question. Um, yeah, and I think that's what's really cool about some of these technologies that we talked about today is, is that not only is there a really neat community outreach component, but there's this kind of, we, there's this kind of understanding that we need to grow our evidence and, and, and our, our um, science behind what these um, um, technologies can afford. Um, and so there are, um, you know, we're doing a couple of clinical trials right now. Um, we had finished up, we just finished up a community clinical trial. Um, and uh, the, um, uh, we had families from three different regions participating in um, uh, mobility technology trials with both Go Baby Go Car and um, a, a commercial device called the Explore Mini. Um, and collected a lot of outcomes related to that. Um, we're doing another clinical trial right now, um, specifically with um, children with Down syndrome in their families and looking at more of a partial body weight support harness system in an enriched play environment. Um, one of the great, if you've got a university um, near you, um, that's a great place to contact in terms of if there's like a a rehab or a developmental psychology program, or even like a computer science uh, engineering program. Um, a lot of those, that's a lot of the spaces where trials will be happening. The other big um, resource um, that, that could lead to participation in a trial would be uh, the website clinicaltrials.gov. Um, and that you can search up by region and, and, and kind of see um, what studies are happening and if, um, you know, if you might be eligible to participate or your child might be eligible to participate. Um, that's, um, that's nice because you can kind of do a search by your geographic region and see what opportunities are available. Yes, for sure. Um, we often share that clinicaltrials.gov, but I, I don't always think about it for, 
you know, more of these technology, we always think kind of that the drug pipeline or right. treatment pipeline. Um, so that's a great thing to bring up that there are trials that aren't necessarily drug or focused, mm -hmm. but yeah. um, focused on mobility and, and technology. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. um, wonderful. One, I do, I'm sorry, I thought of one more question I wanted to ask. Um, in looking at just, you know, the the realm of toys that are out there on the market, and do you see a shift at all in, in toys being more inclusive or more adaptive? Um, are there any specific toys that you recommend or brands, anything out there? Um, you know, I know you're not endorsing brands, but just curious if you feel like there are toys are becoming more inclusive at all. Um, I mean, I, I suppose I can speak to that initially. I also have a young child, so I've been looking at a lot of toys and things recently, but I think, um, I do see, you know, um, there, there have been definitely a growing number of toys that have been representative of more identities. Um, but I think we're, we're kind of just barely skimming the surface, um, as well. And um, the things that I like to to think about when when choosing different different toys, you know, when you're thinking switch adaptive toys, all obviously those are more electronic toys that that we're adapting. Um, but toys in general that um, kind of can can promote all sorts of skills, as as we know, um, are toys that sometimes aren't even toys right like um bowls and spoons and measuring cups and um uh you know tupperware and you know zippers and mm -hmm. you know all of these things um that are just household items um i think we don't need to necessarily be be going out and spending large amounts of money on toys um and that sometimes the simplest toy is the one that actually works for the most people um so um so i think but i do think in terms of representation at least doing an initial glance through a toy catalog recently you know i was pleasantly surprised to start to start to see some some variability in in terms of representation of ability level and race and gender and ethnicity but i i don't think we're near where we should be in terms of inclusivity yeah. heather anything else you want to add yeah i mean i would just you know there are definitely kind of um companies out there um enabling devices is one of them adaptabilities is another one um and we can i can toss the websites in there the, the problem, um, as Sean mentioned, is, is that oftentimes if something is considered, you know, adapted or, um, you know, uh, it, it can be like five, three to five times more expensive for basically the same thing. Um, so I, I do um, very much appreciate and agree with Sean's point that um, some of the low tech uh, type of, of things or, you know, doing some of the switch adaptation um, on your own or with a team um, is, is a great way to improve the accessibility um, of a lot of toys. And Sean, maybe do you want to talk about playgrounds? Because I think there is a nice uptick in uh, improvement, improving accessible playgrounds, and that's your. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, um, yeah. So I think, um, you know, thinking beyond beyond just just toys, right, in the environments in which we serve, I think there's also around the world um, there is an uptick in in therapists and families leading the way in creating inclusive and accessible outdoor spaces. Often we see them termed as accessible playgrounds. Um, I've been involved in a project where we are renovating to be an inclusive and accessible um, outdoor space. So kind of just beyond beyond play, but play in all of its forms. Um, so not just play devices, so to speak. Uh, and so I think that that um, if if renovate if being part of changing the environment is something that you are passionate about. I know that there are several folks um, around the the states and the world that are 
already starting on renovating renovations or you can get involved in in that piece as well because play is not just with toys it's being outside it's socializing it's um sitting next to someone and chatting it is reading under a tree right so lots of different different ways we can consider play absolutely well heather and sean thank you so much for being here with us today we appreciate your time and sharing your expertise um, you're doing wonderful stuff and we appreciate all that you do for the community Thank you.